Nokken Elves, Nokken Oblins, but one of the oldest and most concentrated races on Gilinor. Gnomes have seen their empire crumble and fall to rise up again, seeing wonders of culture and technology slip away from their grasp to be replaced with Gnome Ball and the Gnome Restaurant. What exactly are their origins, and what are they up to now? Gnomes can easily be described in the same way as they are in fairy tales in the real world. Short, about 2-3 to three feet tall, with humanoid features dressed in green tunics and trousers and wearing pointed hats. Though people may compare them to dwarves, they struggle to grow facial hair and have pointed ears similar to elves, kind of like an amalgamation of the two races. Often regarded as having high intelligence and offering the citizens a higher standard of living, the gnomes love nature and tend to make their homes in the treetops and in heavily wooded forests, living one with nature. Despite this peaceful look, they also have a well-trained military, capable of overwhelming armies just through sheer attrition and numbers. Some might think that their small stature would also make them easy adversaries, but to combat that, the gnomes do mount battle tortoises and terror birds to close that gap. Even most civilians carry some type of weaponry, ready to defend their lands at a moment's notice. They hold alliances with many races, both within the Kandoran region and around. There are many gnomes around the world of Gilinor acting as ambassadors, researchers or just explorers trying to get a better understanding of everything to further advance their own goals. While talking is a powerful weapon, the gnomes are also technologically advanced, being rivalled only by dwarves, with one of their most innovative inventions being the gnome glider, letting them, and us, travel through the skies in relative peace especially to Uku Kali Undri to chin some maniacal monkeys. Other innovations of theirs include their military devices, the invention of the parachute, and their knowledge of elven crystal equipment. As for their beliefs, it's commonly thought that they do follow Guthics, and that's for more reasons than them just wearing green. Gnomish mages tend to use claws of Guthics in combat. Hazelmere mentions his loyalty to Guthics, and Hudo shouts great Guthics when showing him giant frog legs. Gnomish children may recite a prayer to Guthics when you speak to them, and of course, our own adventurer mentions at some point that we thought that Guthix created the gnomes and the dwarves. I mean, in the god letters, even Guthix himself expressed a deep fondness for the gnomes. Gnomes have two cities in total that we can visit, the Tree Gnome Stronghold and the Tree Gnome Village. Hazelmere, the legendary gnome, lives on a small islet on the eastern coast of Kandoran, though the gnomes do also have a shipyard that was built on the orders of a certain gnome called Glau. Looking at their history, we can easily look at the Second Age as a good starting point. Gnomes lived in relative peace with dwarves, elves and humans during this time, and allegedly built great and powerful cities, with amazing technologies that we would only envy in this day if they weren't lost to time. During the Third Age, more commonly known as the God Wars, the gnomes chose to not fight, and left the safety of their cities to find even more safety deep below ground, much like their dwarven counterparts. The Fourth Age had the gnomes return to the surface very quickly after the end of the God Wars, and an event known as the Great Migration happened. This event was a voluntary mass immigration by King Helforg that saw the recolonization of the Tree Gnome Stronghold and the Tree Gnome Village. Overall, it was a success, but they did have a brief war against goblins who were seeking a place to settle, and won that war with the help of Glofri's illusion tricks. Though the gnomes thrive today, they do have an ongoing war with General Khazard, and another interesting conflict that we'll cover later. Now that we understand who they are, Let's look into the quest line. The gnome quest line consists of six quests so far. These are the Tree Gnome Village, the Grand Tree, Monkey Madness 1, the Eyes of Glofri, the Path of Glofri, and also Monkey Madness 2. The main themes regarding the quest line are all about enemies and traitors attempting to destroy the gnomes, but through our interference we stop this from happening. There are technically two quest lines within this one overarching quest line. The Gao quest line consists of the Grand Tree, Monkey Madness 1, and Monkey Madness 2. Quest line 2 can be called the Glofri quest line. Let's start with something simple though Tree Gnome Village. Detached from both quest lines, Tree Gnome Village was the first gnome quest released and focuses mainly on the war between General Khazard's army and the Tree Gnomes. We speak to King Bolrin and the Tree Gnome Maze, and he explains how three orbs have been stolen and we, of course, agree to help retrieve them. We make our way to the battlefield and speak to Commander Montai, and help him repair the defences before we speak to three trackers to know where to fire the ballista. Though the first two trackers give us the correct coordinates, the third has very clearly been driven to madness through the chaos and we need to decipher the coordinates from his ramblings. Once we head back and fire the ballista, 
we go through a crumbled wall and retrieve one orb. Handing that back to Bolorin, we head back out for the other two, and we do this by killing the Khazard Warlord, the guy you'll most likely see endless versions of if you AFK train combat in Nightmare Zone. We kill him and pick up the last two orbs and hand them back to Bolorin, where we see the Spirit Tree return to life, and the protections around the village are once again brought back to life. Job done. Moving on to the first sub-quest line, the Glau quest series. We start with the Grand Tree. The Grand Tree has us speaking to King Narno Shireen, and he tasks us with reviving the Grand Tree. This is where we first meet Hazelmere, though we cannot understand him so we utilise sign language. And examining a bark sample we give him, he gives us a message that reads, A man came to me with the King's seal. I gave the man the Conia rocks, and the Conian rocks will kill the tree. We report back to King Narno immediately, and he directs us to Glau, the head tree guardian. But when we speak to him, he only says he'll take care of the problem. Very quickly, Glau imprisons a human as he was found carrying the Conia rocks. But when we speak to him, he explains he only had the rocks as he was following Glau's orders before hinting that we should maybe search Glau's home for clues. And of course, we do a little digging and we find his journal. But when we try to speak to Glau about it, he has us imprisoned. Though being bunkmates of Charlie, we do get the password to access a mysterious shipyard on the Karamjan coast. King Narno appears and frees us telling us to talk to the glider pilot who flies us to Karamja. Though the glider does crash, we end up going into the shipyard after giving them a secret password, and we walk out with proof of Glau's plans, and let me tell you, they aren't good. 30 ships for 300 troops is what he's after, and I don't think he's looking to get 99 sailing. Anyway, when we go back to the Grand Tree, we speak to Glau's girlfriend, and end up back inside his house, gathering more evidence for the king who refuses to believe us. Though we do find twig letters that spell Tuzo and solve a puzzle that lets us enter a trapdoor, as Glau, in typical James Bond fashion, tells us his plans before trying to kill us. He wants to wipe out humanity. We are beset by a black demon and kill it, and we walk along the passage until we find King Shireen and explain how Glau attacked us. Still in disbelief, he sends a scout to find Glau, where they find him hiding among stones, and the king finally comes around and realises what we've been trying to say. We locate the last Laconia rock and save the tree. Job well done and we get access to the known glide system. Being the second quest in the Glau quest series and riding off our first victory against the treacherous Glau, we find out that the king has ordered the 10th squad, kind of like the navy seals I guess, to oversee the decommissioning of the shipyard to ensure all plans the Glau had are nipped in the bud. Though it has been a while since he's heard from that team, so when we speak to King Narnode he requests that we head down to the shipyard to investigate what's going on. We do go down to the shipyard but find that the 10th squad has been blown off course, the one downside of the glider system. They find themselves on an island far away that houses a hostile civilization, deadly wildlife and very unfriendly monkeys. In order to save them, we even had to use a monkey Grigri to disguise ourselves as a monkey to try and influence the leader King Awogi. Though this is where we find out that while we were trying to free the captive gnomes, Glau had sent his bodyguards. Waydar and GLO Karanok to make a pact with Awogi, get rid of the squad and ensure the shipyard operation continues and Awogi can enjoy part of the spoils of war that will inevitably come from humanity's destruction. One of the 10th squad members gives us a sigil and once we equip it we are teleported into what ends up being a battle against another one of Glau's pets, the jungle demon. Though he can hit high and we do have Gnomekind's finest to help us, we strike the final blow and watch as a demon falls before our might, before we promptly escape the island and make our way back to King Narno to inform him of what's gone on. The third part of the Glau quest series, but also the first quest to be uniquely created for old school RuneScape after its release, is Monkey Madness 2. If you had a shudder down your spine, don't worry, I did too. That stealth section haunts me to this day. This quest is very long, and that's what the official length is anyway. But damn, it is long. We once again speak to King Narno, and he explains that Glau has escaped, trying to find clues and asking his girlfriend about his whereabouts. Our findings point to Assistant Lee Smith being the culprit who allowed Glau to escape. So we try to find Lee Smith, only to learn that they were lost while attempting to fly to Apatol via air balloon. We make our way back to Apatol and equip our monkey speak amulet and our monkey Grigri, and speak to King Awogi about his military plans though he finds this suspicious and explains he will only speak to Crook about this. So what's our next option? Kill Crook, make a Crook Grigri to disguise as him, 
and then speak to our Wogi, of course. We find a hidden trap door in the jungle portion of Apatol and enter Crook's dungeon, and this is potentially one of the lengthier parts of the quest. But at the same time, it gives you access to Maniacal Monkeys finally, so you can chin or burst to your heart's content to get some fat XP gains. There are two ways of making your way through the caves, the agility route and the tanking route. But either way, the two paths converge on the entrance to Crook's room and we enter that cave that Crook resides in. Crook hits hard, being able to hit up to 33 with melee, but you can flinch him, which is what I did when I first done the quest, so you know, play the game how you will. We kill him, take his paw, and create a Crook Monkey Grigri. We speak to Awogi and he reveals that the monkeys are planning another attack with the help of Gutanoff Ogres and the generals of the Troll Stronghold. We head to the Troll Stronghold and challenge Cobb, and once we defeat him he begs for mercy and agrees to not help the monkeys. Then we head to Gutanoff and we find Keith and challenge him to a death match. and just like Cobb, once he nears death he begs for mercy and agrees to not help the monkeys. We then return to Garka, our 10th squad contact on Apatol, and he tasks us with finding Lee Smith and we'll find them somewhere high up on one of the buildings. We speak to him and find out that the monkeys are constructing a fleet of ships on the west coast of Apatol, and before we head out, we tell Garka, and here we are, probably the most infuriating part of any quest, at least in my opinion. While my description is going to be short, this part of the quest can take a tremendously long time to do. It just depends on how good you are at stealth in RuneScape. That's right, stealth. As the wiki description calls it, monkey gear solid. Our job is relatively simple. We need to collect six satchels, fill them with explosives, and then place them in different areas on the platforms to ensure that airships don't make it off the ground and are destroyed before they get a chance to be used maliciously. Once we succeed in this mission, we make our way back to Crook's dungeon and traverse some monkey bars using Crook's Grigri, where we then climb onto a mutated gorilla to speak to Glau. He tells us to send three tormented gorillas back into the cages. Once we do this, we learn more of Glau's plans and he tells us how his last strain of mutagen was too unstable, and once his mutagen is perfected, he's going to make it airborne and release it across Apatol to gather an army completely under his control. We sabotage the devices to ensure that it can't be used, and we proceed to inform our Wogi that the trolls and ogres have dropped out of the pact. The secret weapon has had complications. And so, he cancels the assault on the mainland, and strips Crook of his rank and duties. Mission success? Hopefully? Well, not really. We see Glau has proceeded with his attack anyway on his personal airship. Fantastic. We quickly make our way back to King Narnode and tell him that the gnome stronghold will be attacked. Who then gets us to recruit Neve into our party to defend the stronghold. She gets her cousin Steve to take her place while she's gone. As we walk around the stronghold with Neve, tortured gorillas will appear and we have to kill them until she urges us to return to the king. When we do, he gets the 10th squad to take care of the rest while he sends us north to where Glau's airship has crashed. So we restock on the bank and quickly make our way there, seeing Glau has survived of numerous of his experiments. We take out two tortured and two demonic gorillas before we turn our eyes on Glau again, and he does the unthinkable. He drinks his own mutagen, which transforms him into an abomination. Though Neve attempts to stop him, she gets knocked back and a boulder falls on her, killing her instantly. Can we get an F in the comments for Neve? She does drop her Elysian spirit shield, but don't try and pick it up unless you want to be greatly disappointed. We fight Glau through three phases and have him fall at our feet. The cavern begins to collapse and we're teleported outside by Zuknok. Before we explain that Glau is dead, but Neve's life was also taken. We then explain to the king that Glau's demonic creations have also been trapped deep within the caverns. And he informs us that Awawogi wants to visit the stronghold to set up a peace treaty with the mainland, showing a moment of historic political importance. We do get a bunch of rewards from this, one of the most important ones probably being the royal seed pod. But anyway... That concludes the Glau questline, and with how it ends, that probably is the end in my eyes. We probably won't see any continuation of it, but the same can't be said for the Glofry questline, so let's get into it. The Glofry questline starts with the eyes of Glofry, and sees the gnome wizard Brimstale asking us to help rebuild a machine that was crafted by a famous gnome engineer. This all stems from these cute creatures that have suddenly appeared and began wandering around the gnomish settlements. We visit Hazelmere once again to gain information on how to repair the machine. He then shows us memories of the gnome's past, especially one where Glofry uses his magic to scare away the goblins, and then uses his magic to cover up the death of a spirit tree named Argento. Oaknock builds a machine that removes the illusion magic that Glofry has mastered, revealing the treachery to the king, who then banishes Glofry from the stronghold. 
Once we get back to the machine, we repair it by solving a short puzzle and get the machine working. We speak the Brim style, and once we activate the machine, the cute creatures turn into evil ones, and we kill them before speaking to King Narno again, who only shows concern for what this could mean for the future. The path of Glofry has us see that King Bolron has a new pet that looks cute and cuddly, but unfortunately, when we used Unox machine, which is similar to Oaknox machine, we learn that this creature is once again an evil watcher. During this is when we find King Bolry's diary, who formerly ruled the village. Here is where we learn that an advisor to King Bolry wanted him to campaign to rule in King Helthorg's place after his death due to old age. This would be in direct competition against the king's son, Argenthorg. Though Argenthorg activates Unox's machine and exposes this mystery advisor to be Glofry, making Bolry stand down as a candidate and leave the stronghold whilst abdicating the throne to the tree known village. We deal with the treacherous creature, and then we are tasked with finding Long Gramble. And when we find him, he explains how he believes that Arpo Sandra, a city founded by Glofry, is close to the poisonous wastes. We then hear a spirit tree calling to us. When we approach it, we find out that the connection to the Anima Mundi, the life force of the world, has been lost due to the toxic waste corrupting its roots. We then use a set of crystal chimes to heal the tree, connecting it to the rest of the world. When we head west of the spirit tree and into a sewer entrance, we see warp creatures that definitely don't look too kind. Having our trusty earmuffs and protect from missiles active, we traverse the dungeon and enter a room that contains warp terror birds. We slay three of them and head towards a heavy door before a cutscene plays, showing two intelligent terror bird guards talking to each other. They speak of how boring it is until they notice us and press an alarm causing tar to rise and toxic gas to seep into the room. Right before we black out, Hazelmere appears and gets us out of there, and before he leaves us to continue on, he tells us of his visions of the future, about a little quest called Wild Guthic Sleeps. But so far, that is where the tale ends. The known questline is far from finished, at least on the Glofry aspect of it. As far as Glau is concerned, we're done with his schemes considering his corpse is buried under tons of rubble. What else could we find with Glofry? Well, from the short hints that we have and the fact that we basically have confirmation that there is an entire hidden underground city that Glofry is in control of, it'll be interesting to see where the story goes. I mean, the story is still largely incomplete in RuneScape 3, with the latest quest, The Prisoner of Glofry, coming out many years ago and still not concluding the questline. I do hope that we get to see Arpo Sandra at some point and the conclusion of that war against the Gnomish Empire in some aspect. There's even some references of the city from other questlines, like in Forgettable Tale, where some gnomes from Arpexandra are talking to the Red Axe director and Colonel Grimson, which just hints that they may be involved in the Red Axe schemes as well. If you enjoyed the video, please do like and subscribe, it'd mean the world. But as always, thanks for watching, and see you next time.